In your Bibles this morning, Judges chapter number 2, I want to read uh, a few verses uh, to us today. And uh, I preached this last night at the Valentine's banquet. And I told them last night, I said, now, I planned on preaching it this morning. If it didn't fly last night, I'd preach something different this morning. Amen. <laughs> so things went pretty good. <laughs> but uh, I want to preach a message entitled, uh, How to Keep Your Family from Living in a Cesspool. How to Keep Your Family from Living in a Cesspool. I want you to look here in Judges chapter number 2, and we'll start reading in verse number 6. The Bible says, When Joshua had left the, let the people go, the children of Israel went every man into his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance at Timnathres, and in the mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gash. And also all that generation, this is my text, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, notice this, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which God had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them. And they bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, verse 13, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them, and sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Lord, we love you today. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to preach. Now, Lord, we've enjoyed the the offering time, the song service, the prayer time. But Lord, now we pray that you speak through us. Lord, use us today. May we say everything that we should say and refrain from saying things that we ought not say. Lord, guide our lips and, and guide our hearts. May we all have open hearts to your word. May you open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Dear Lord, if there was ever a time I needed you help to preach, it's right now. And I pray that you fill me with thy Holy Spirit. Use me today. Lord, if for somebody that listens to this message that's lost and on their way to hell, I pray this will be the day they trust Christ as their Lord and Savior. And for every child of God that will hear this message, I pray that you would work in their hearts today. And may we remember some of the needs that our families have, that we might be able to hinder our family and our offspring from living in a cesspool. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In order to understand the passage that we have just read, uh, you, you need to read, read the last couple of chapters of the book of Joshua. And I encourage you to go home and do that. In fact, I might just give you a call tonight and see if you did read those last couple of chapters of Joshua. Just kidding, I'm not going to do that. But I encourage you when you go home, get get the book of the, get your Bible down, open Joshua about 24 maybe the previous chapter, and read through Judges chapter number 2. It's just a couple of chapters. And you need to see this because America is right here in this passage. The modern day church in America is right here. I mean, this, this message today is right down where we all live. Okay? Israel, had, if you remember, was able to go in and possess the land. But they did not drive out all the inhabitants in the book of Joshua. You remember that, right? God told them to drive them out or they're going to be thorns and in your side and they didn't do all of that. And so they settled for some things. As a result, uh, their, uh, their lives and their kids' lives, they went astray. And so much so that Joshua, God's man, calls them to the carpet. I mean, boy, they had, they had a, uh, a call to repentance by God's man. And in Joshua 24, 15, he says, Choose you this day whom you'll serve. 
And he goes on to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Very, very important verse in the book of Joshua. And so we find here that as a result of Joshua filled with the Spirit of God, calling his people to repentance, they did respond in a positive way. And, uh, and the Bible tells us in Judges 2, as well as the end of Joshua, uh, uh, the last little bit of Joshua, uh, that we find that, that all the people, verse 7, served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And those that outlived Joshua, they served the Lord too. So you see, um, uh, we, we find that they repented and these guys were living out their days in obedience. But you come down to verse 10, and uh, we have a troubling verse. And, and I often, when I read this, where it says in verse 10, and there arose another generation after them. After who? That generation of people that lived, that, that was Joshua's contemporaries. Uh, those that, that Joshua and his, and his uh, contemporaries they, that, that got right, those are the people. There came a generation after them. The Bible says, and they knew not the Lord, nor yet the works that God done for Israel. Now this is a troubling thing to me. How can one generation know so much and yet another generation be totally depraved and deprived for that matter? Uh, we learned a very valuable principle here this morning that many times what you and I do in moderation, our kids will indulge in in excess. You ever thought about that? Boy, we have to be careful uh, in our lives. God is not obligated to bless and reward single acts of obedience, though He often does. But you know, He does honor a lifetime of obedience. Israel had gotten astray. Israel had messed up. But they did get right, and they lived out the rest of their days right with God and in obedience. And you know, when you think about that, when somebody... Uh, experiences a move of God as Israel did many times. Think, think about it. The Red Sea parting. The Jordan River parting for them. They saw manna from heaven. Uh, water coming out of the rock. The walls of Jericho falling and a host of other things as you'll find uh, in, in, uh, uh, as they come out of the wilderness and in, into the promised land. I mean, they saw a move of God many times. Okay? And you know, when you experience stuff like that, though you stray away, you still have an anchor point. But when you don't have that, it makes it much harder to get right with the Lord. You see, every generation has to, to see and experience God for themselves. You know, you don't get saved by proxy. You can't pray nobody into heaven. You can't light a candle somewhere and get them out of, out of purgatory. You can't, you can't pay indulgences to get them out of purgatory. There ain't no such thing. The Bible nowhere teaches that stuff. You don't get baptized to get to heaven. Friend, you get saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? That's plain Bible teaching. And we find here this morning uh, that uh, each generation, they have to see and experience God for themselves. It's one thing when mom and daddy know God it's one thing when they experience the Lord and, and they see God move in their lives and they see answers to prayer and they see how God is working their soul. That's one thing. But just because mom and daddy knows God does not mean my youngins is going to get saved. And it doesn't mean your youngins is going to get saved. Now, our desire is that they would be saved. Amen? But you see, each generation has to be saved. And I can't make them get saved. I can't put them through no process to get them saved. All I can do is pray for them, lead by example, and witness to them just like I would anybody else. Amen? And we've got to get back to that in our church age today. But we see here that each generation has to experience that. Otherwise, folks will forsake the Lord and have no mooring point in their lives. There's a generation of people out here that are totally disconnected from old-fashioned Bible preaching and teaching. And as a result of that, there are many folks, there are many folks around us today that um, they, have, they have nothing but what the world teaches them. They have nothing but what folks have taught them, tradition has taught them, or what their families have said about the truth. Many folks, uh, as a result of this big disconnect, many churches have adopted worldly ways trying to reach that generation. 
It's just the same way it's always been. We've got to preach the Word of God. Amen? Get back to the Scriptures. Now, for this very reason, that is, uh, each generation has to be reminded of what God has done, though they didn't see the Red Sea crossing or the Jordan River uh, parting. They could hear about it and learn about it, okay? And uh, as a result of that, God instituted visible reminders for each successive generation. You remember the feast, the Passover feast before they came out of Egypt? Well, there's a lot of folks, right, in, in, in Joshua's day that did not come out. But they did celebrate the Passover. They weren't there for the first one. But they did celebrate it and they learned about what it meant. And there were other feasts. The first fruits, unleavened, and all that sort of thing. There were sacrifices. They were visible reminders of the work of God. The tabernacle itself, the furniture, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the labor, the brazen altar, uh, the, 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 the uh, construction materials in the tabernacle, all of that was a visible reminder of God and what He had done. The memorials. For example, if you were to do this in Joshua chapter 4, verse 21, if you're taking notes, write that down. Uh, you'll find that as a result of them crossing over the Jordan River, going into the Promised Land, God said take out 12 stones from that river and put them on the west bank of that Jordan River. And you pile them up there, and when you're, and it says, it, I'm paraphrasing, when your children ask you what meaneth these stones, you're going to be able to tell them what happened. Amen? And it was a visible reminder. Now here's the thing. <clears throat> here's something we ought to remember today. Just because I may eventually get right with God does not mean my offspring is going to recover or even get right with God themselves. Israel made a blunder. Joshua calls them to repentance. They get right, glory to God. But kids and grandkids and great-grandkids come along and they have nothing. What happened? There was a failure. There was a breakdown somewhere. You know what happened? Those wild oats that were sown came up. Yes, mom and daddy made mistakes, but they got right. But during that time of lapse, those kids and grandkids made some decisions. And just because you serve the Lord does not mean your kids are going to want to serve God, especially if you don't communicate certain things to them. So that brings me down to our message today. And I'm not going to preach too awful long this morning, and I don't want to lie about that, okay? I am hungry this morning, alright? It's been a while since I ate. Those Bavita cracker things have long since worn off, alright? So, I'm hurting today, and I need something to eat. So I promise you, I'm going to do my best to say what i got to say, and I'll get out of the way and trust the Lord would use the message this morning. There are four needs every family has that I want to remind us about this morning, because you know what? Our church family's right here. There are folks in here today, you're serving God. You weren't always doing that, but you're serving God today. And you've got family out there that's disconnected. They don't know what God's done. You may tell them right now a little bit, but they don't have any idea what a move of God is. It scared them half to death if they ever got anywhere close to something like that. And there's folk in our community that are disconnected. So there's four things you've got to remember. Number one, I'm reminded about the need to talk about the Lord. Now again, I've already encouraged you to read Joshua, the last couple chapters of Joshua when you go home. Write this other one down. Read Deuteronomy chapter 4. Every mom and daddy ought to read that chapter today. Every grandma and grandpa ought to read Deuteronomy chapter 4. You find as Moses is reminding Israel about some old-fashioned practical teaching about what they should do in their home concerning the Word of God, the works that God has done in relation to their family. It's all found in Deuteronomy 4. <clears throat> and, we, and so, as I mentioned, the first need is that we need to talk about the Lord. I think about the word communication. Communication. You know, any mom and dad have to communicate in order to get along, right? Brothers and sisters have to communicate. And I don't mean... Uh, by shrapnel and precious metals flying through the house. Amen? And I don't mean smoke signals. The wife wants to send a message to her husband, so she goes to the old-fashioned way of smoke signals. She goes in there and burns supper. Amen? And sends smoke throughout the house and let her husband know something. I don't believe in that. Amen? But I believe in communicating. 
Mom and dad, husband, wife, son, daughter, grandma, grandpa, a church in a church setting, we've got to communicate with one another. We need to communicate to our friends and family, our kids, the works of God. Israel, somewhere along the line, evidently failed to communicate the works of God. How else could a generation come along, guys, and not know what God had done? How could you be a descendant of Joshua and his contemporaries and, and knowing what they saw? They saw that Jordan River part for them. They saw the walls of Jericho fall. How can somebody experience that and not spread that to somebody else and tell their kids and grandkids? How can that happen? They did not communicate. And let me tell you something. If you know Christ as your Savior, you better make it absolutely clear uh, to your spouse, to your family, to your grandkids, not only by lips, but by action and example that you know God. It is a sad time in a family when they lose somebody and they go to the to speak to the pastor about a funeral and, and nobody knows if mom and daddy is really saved or not. It makes it really hard when folks are saying their last goodbyes wondering where they're going to meet their loved one uh, or, or not. I'm going to tell you something, folks. People need to know God. and We need to communicate and talk about the Lord. What does your family talk about? What is your conversation about in your home? I, mean, I tell you so many homes today, it's all about sports and all about playing and recreation and all these non-essentials. Now my kids, and I can only speak for my family, I've seen it in others, but I can only speak for my family. But uh, I found that as my kids have gotten older, what I talk about and what I like is what they like. And it's not necessarily because that's what they, they like themselves, but they want to be like their daddy and they want to please their daddy. And they want, to, they want to have something in common with their daddy. So they like what I like. Now, if you like fishing, odds are some of your kids are going to like fishing. If you like bar hopping, your kids are going to come along and they're going to like bar hopping. I can give you an example here in this community of where a, 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 a father is now in jail for a while and has a son out there growing up by himself with grandparents. Sad situation. Sad situation. You know what? If, that, if, if things don't change, like father, like son, the apple don't fall far from the tree. Amen? If you like serving God, it's no guarantee your kids are going to like serving God, but they'll have more of an aptitude for it if they get saved. You see what I'm saying? Hey, what you talk about and what you're passionate about needs to be communicated to your family. If you love Jesus, there ought not be any question in your home that, that you love the Lord. If you've had answers to prayer, share that with your family. Of course, you've got to be praying if you're going to have answers to prayer. So if you don't pray, you ain't going to have much to talk about, are you? Amen? Hey, what about when you read your Bible? Share with your family some things that you read in the Bible. Of course, you can't do that unless you're reading your Bible. Amen? I tell you what I like to do is when we have a good service, I like to talk about it. I like to share folks on Facebook and friends and family. Hey, man, God stirred my heart today in church, man. I was blessed, and here's why. Boom. And you tell them. But you can't do that unless you come to church and, and you have an open heart and you want God to speak to you. But I tell you what, we can keep on going the same old, same old, and we can do our own thing, self-willed, and just uh, and, and have church in our life is just window dressing. We can do that, and guess what's going to happen? That generation coming after you and I, guess what's going to happen? They're not going to know God. They're not going to know what God's done and what God can do because we have failed to communicate and talk about the Lord. Number two, I think that there's a need of worship in the Lord. Now, I know that some folks equate worship with having a nice, fancy sanctuary. We have a nice, fancy sanctuary here. Amen? God can meet with us just as soon as He can meet uh, over there in a nice, fancy sanctuary. Right? I was reading here recently about some Baptistic groups of people. They weren't called Baptists at the time. But back hundreds of years ago, because of fear of the state-run churches and things like that, in order for them to have a worship time corporately together, they had to meet in the woods at night. And they were called a certain name because of that. 
You know, it's an amazing thing to me. It doesn't matter what the, the building is. You get together, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Guess what you can do? You can worship God. Hey, you can worship God uh, by yourself. You can worship God in your home, in the prayer closet, wherever it might be. Hey, but you know what we got to do? There's a need of worshiping God. Amen? Amen. Now, worshiping God is not just about coming in here and going through some liturgy or some formal service. That's not worshiping God. Worshiping God comes from your heart. Amen? And praise and adoration for what God has done. You read your Bible and God squeezes your heart. Amen? Maybe a tear comes down across your cheek and, and into your beard if you're a man. Amen? And, and down, in, down on you and runs your mascara or whatever if you're a lady. Hey, you know, uh, when God squeezes those heart strings a little bit and you begin to just thank God and praise Him. Amen? I tell you what, I like good gospel music. And sometimes I'll be having some gospel music on and I'll be working on something and, and I'll hear a song and it reminds me of a truth in God's Word and I'll just raise my hand right there and say, Praise God. I'll shout amen. My kids hear it, I'm sure. Hey, I don't care. I'm by myself. I'm not in church, but I'm going to praise God. Amen. I've been riding down the road and hear a preacher preaching or, or hear a song or think about something God stirred my heart about in His Word and I'll just throw my hand up and say, Thank you, Jesus. There's something about old-fashioned worship. Worship, I think about the word celebration. Again, Joshua 4, 21. What well, meaneth these stones? Man, they put them stones on the west bank of that Jordan River. Why? It was a form of celebration. Those kids would come along and they would say, Mama, Daddy, why has that pile of stones been sitting there all these years? Well, let me come here and tell you about it, son. And daughter, let me tell you about what God did for us years ago. Hallelujah! You talk about God showing up. You talk about worshiping the Lord, reminding folks of what God has done. A milestone in their life. I think about the word consideration. When you're worshiping God, you are considering the works of God and who He is and what He has done. Amen? And that by, by a, a, a natural occurrence, when you're doing that, that's going to provoke somebody else. And they're going to say, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? You say, hey, I'll tell you what's wrong with me. And you can just share what's on your heart. There was a generation that come along and they didn't know God. They didn't know. They were worshiping false deities. They were worshiping false gods and bowing down the idols. How can a generation know God and their kids and grandkids and great-grandkids turn and go so far in the other direction? Somewhere along the line, worship broke down. Worship broke down. And I'm going to tell you something. If we don't get, get a hold of this thing about what true worship is all about and what communicating about the Lord and talking about Him is all about, we ain't going to have much of a church around here. Amen? Number three. Not only that, but I'm reminded of the need to serve the Lord. That's what Joshua said he was going to do in Joshua 24, 15. You can do what you want to do. I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to serve God whether you come or not. Amen? And that's about the attitude you've got to have. Hey, uh, just because you get right with God and say, hey, I'm, I want God to work in my life and use me, that doesn't mean the paper's going to call you up the next day and want to give you an interview. Hey, that doesn't mean Fox News or CNN or NBC is going to come out with a reporter and video camera and document your decision to serve God. Hey, you might be standing all alone, but I'm going to tell you something. You just keep on because God's going to use you to reach that next generation. I tell you what the young people in Blair need. It's not more rock music, and I don't care what kind of genre and how you Christianize the words and all that stuff. I, Blair in Washington County does not need more of that trash. They don't need no false worship. I tell you what they need, friend. They need some mom and daddies and some grandmas and grandpas that know what it means to serve God. Amen. That's what they need. They need to see an example of people doing their best to live right, do right. No, we don't get it right every time, and yes, we mess up. But they need that. There's a disconnect, and we're part of the problem unless we're getting right and we're going on for God. We need to be serving God. I think about the word consecration. Israel got right after Joshua's rebuke and called repentance. I think about the word commit, or commitment or committed. An example of faithful service provokes one another for the reason of service. I ain't found a person yet 
that was in sin or maybe just in an apathetic lifestyle in their Christian life. I've never seen a person like that yet. That when they did get right and get on fire for God and decide they're going to go on for the Lord and they start stepping out by faith and start getting more involved and start serving God, I've never seen one of those folks yet that were not asked, what's all about this big change in your life? You know what that does? When we serve the Lord, do you know what that does to people? It brings a little bit of conviction. They want to know about, why are you doing that? Why are you so excited about that? Why are you going to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night? Why do you like Pastor Shank, that, uh, that southern hillbilly that comes out of nowhere and just shows up all of a sudden? Why do you go listen to him preach and shout and turn red in the face and spit and slobber five rows back? Why do you go and be a part of Great Commission Baptist Church? Why do you like that? He can say, I'll tell you why. Because God saved me. And I've made mistakes and I'm going to serve Him the rest of my days. Well, you know what? That next generation might get some help if they see your faithful example. But if you're not faithful, if we're not faithful, privately and publicly, how can we expect our neighbors to see a difference in our lives? How can we expect um, our family to see a difference if, uh, if we find every kind of excuse in the world to miss church or to miss out on opportunities to witness or share or, or be with somebody? How can we expect anything to happen? There's a generation out here, friend, that is just like Judges 2, verse 10. They knew not God, nor yet the works that God had done for Israel. And then last of all, and I'm done, last of all, I'm reminded not only about the need to talk about the Lord, to worship the Lord, and to serve the Lord, but I'm reminded of the need to know the Lord. To know the Lord. I think about the word certainty. Now, there's a lot of folks out here you talk to. Do you know for sure if you died right now, you'd be in heaven? I hope so. And I know that there are some people that say that, and deep within them, yet they know they are saved. Maybe they just talk wrong. But a lot of the folks that say, I hope so, the reason why they're saying that is because they really believe in a work salvation. Yes, they do believe in Jesus. Yes, they do put their faith in the Lord. But they are not trusting Christ and Him alone for salvation. It's Jesus and either their baptism, their church membership, their good works, or whatever it is. And they think that by all of that, they'll, that God will overlook their sins and they'll be able to get into heaven. You know what? They're going straight to hell. The pathway to hell has been paved with good intentions. There's a lot of folks standing in the doorway of salvation and never gone through the door. But I'll tell you one thing. If you know God, and you know that with certainty, somebody asked me, say, Andrew, do you know for sure if you died right now you'd be in heaven? And my answer would be, yes, sir, I know that. Andrew, how do you know that? On February the 16th, 1992, the age of 16 years old. An old-fashioned preacher preached the gospel. And the Spirit of God tugged on my heart, sir, ma'am. And I responded to that. I knew I needed to be saved. I knew I was going to die and go to hell unless I got saved. And I came down and somebody, uh, the pastor had a man talk to me about Jesus. One more time there at that altar. And sir... That man told me that Jesus died on the cross for me in my place because I was a sinner deserving of hell. And sir, I believe that. And I asked God to forgive me and I put my faith and trust in what Jesus did for me over 2,000 years ago. And sir, based on the authority of God's Word, I know I am saved. I know I'll be in heaven. And Andrew, is there any doubt about that? Well, there are times I doubt and wonder sometimes because I, I, I don't have the faith I ought to have. But I, I always get my assurance, sir, when I come back to the Word of God. Ma'am, I know I'm saved. I'll be in heaven when I die because God's Word tells me so. Not some preacher, not some creed that I believe in, not some organization, not because my mom and daddy were saved or any of that. I'm saved because God saved me. And I know that for certain. You see, Israel, though at times was backslidden, they did know God. They knew the Lord. They had some great times with the Lord. They saw the mighty move of God many times. And you know what? They had that mooring point, and they, they knew what God had done for them. 
I think about not only the word certainty, I think about the word constraint. The Bible says in Corinthians, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Is, it, it binds us. It moves us. When you know God, it will influence your actions. Knowing God is essential and will influence the actions of others. If you know the Lord for certain today, if you know God has worked in your life as a believer, and you have some testimony about some things where God has shown Himself strong on your behalf, maybe an answer to prayer, maybe this or maybe that, but you know what? You can reach that next generation, whether it be your kids or your grandkids, because you know what? When you look at somebody eyeball to eyeball and you say something to them with conviction in your heart, I don't care what they believe before they talk to you, they, they're going to know that you believe what you believe. Whether they believe or not, they know you believe it. And God Almighty can use that. I tell you what this next generation, generation needs. They don't need pansy preachers. They don't need some watered down Christianity. It needs to be a stark contrast. Somebody says they're saved on the way to heaven. There ought to be a stark contrast between them and somebody lost. That's what's going to reach that next generation for Christ. My generation come along. They didn't fight a lot of the battles our forefathers fought. They didn't experience a lot of the moves of God that my grandma and grandpa's and different ones can talk about. But I am glad to say that, that the Lord has let me in on a few things. I've seen some great answers to prayer. I've seen God show Himself strong on my behalf many times. Though I've not seen some things I'd like to see, I do know that God has worked in my life. And, and I can share that with some people if they'll let me talk to them about it. I'd be glad to talk and, 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 and explain some of the things that God has done in my life. And, you know, and I'd be glad to do that. And you know what? As long as I'm willing to do that, I'll keep reaching people in Blair and Washington County. I won't get all of them, but I'll get some of them that will want to listen. And you know what? The same is true with you. Let me just say, say it this way. We're going to reap what we sow. Israel reaped some consequences. Though they, out, though they got right with God, and though they served the Lord and, they, and throughout the rest of their life, though they enjoyed the blessing of God, and, and though they, uh, out, you know, at the rest of their life, they lived in obedience, as far as we know, they still had to reap what they sowed. Could you imagine the tears that were shed and the heartbreak and the heartache that they must have faced watching those next generations go further and further and further away from God? We're like that here in America. It breaks your heart. That generation, that gap is, is getting further and further and further. And now it seems like it's like the Grand Canyon. But I'll tell you what can get over there. i tell you what can build a bridge over that. You just keep talking about Jesus. Hey, you just keep worshiping God. You keep serving the Lord, amen. And you just keep knowing the Lord. And I'll tell you what will happen. Brick by brick, girder by girder, nail by nail, and board by board. You'll build a bridge right across that, that gulf and you'll be able to reach that daughter, that son, that neighbor, that family member, that co-worker that seems to be so far from the truth. You can reach them. You can reach them. And if you're here today and you're not saved, I want you to know that you can know for sure if you died right now that you'd be in heaven. If that's you today, please come see me after service and I'll be glad to take my Bible and show you how you can know Christ as your Savior. Every head bowed, every eye closed.